Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be doing a case study and we're going to be going over renal disorders. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it. Go ahead and give it a thumbs up now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you have done so already. And be sure to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. There you can sign up for a next generation NCLEX review session, both part one and part two. Part one, I teach you how to think critically. I go over prioritization. I go over delegation. I go over different scenarios and words and phrases that NCLEX may present and where your brain is supposed to go with that information. In part two, I go over actual NCLEX type questions, rationales, and most importantly, how you need to be applying them on your exam. Maybe you um, are in a nursing program and you just need some extra help. I also provide one-on-one -on -one private tutoring sessions. Maybe you wanna pick my brain about something, we can have a consultation session. If you're currently in the program and you're not doing well, you're not doing well at all, you're about to get kicked out of this program, you have to do really well on your next exam, check out my audio lesson. See if I have an audio lesson that matches the topics that are going to be covered on your next exam. Thank me later. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. My handle is the same everywhere, Nexus Nursing. Without any further ado, guys, let's get started. The first thing I want to do, let me move my face so you can look at, take a look at this case study. Look what it says. So we have a 55-year-old male that presents to the emergency department with complaints of fatigue, swelling in his legs, shortness of breath. He has a medical history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and chronic alcohol use. The patient's experiencing decreased urine output has a history and has a history of weight gain. Vital signs are as follows, blood pressure 160 over 90, heart rate 95, respiratory rate 20 breaths per minute, temp 98.6. Lab results show elevated serum creatinine, BUN, and potassium levels, along with decreased glomerular filtration rate. And as you can see, right next to uh, this case study, I have questions. Now, here's the thing. Um, before we even get to the questions, here's what I strongly encourage you to do as a student. When you are presented with a body of information, you read the whole thing. After you've read the whole thing, go back and highlight, star, underline, do something to bring attention to everything that's abnormal. When you do that, it kind of creates a picture in your mind where at least you should be going with this information so you're not all over the place. So before we even look at the questions, let's take a look at this case study and let's go ahead and highlight everything that's wrong. We got a 55-year-old male that presents to the emergency department with complaints of. I'm telling you right now, whenever you get a case study and they say the uh, patient presents to the hospital or they come to see a healthcare provider, I don't care what setting it is, whatever they are complaining of or they are presenting with, those two things, whatever comes after that, highlight it. Why? Because that's what's wrong. So they're complaining of, let's go ahead and highlight everything, fatigue, oh, here we go, fatigue, swelling in the legs, shortness of breath. Where do I go to highlight? There we go. Okay. Patient has a medical history of, we're going to highlight everything that's wrong, hypertension, diabetes, chronic alcohol use. Why are we highlighting everything that's wrong that the patient has a history of? Remember, when we're trying to figure out what's wrong with our patient, because lots of times we may get a question, you know, what diagnosis do we expect or what do we expect to be the patient to be treated for? The medical history tells you a lot because guess what? Those are risk factors that can lead you to certain diagnoses that you would expect that patient be treated for, okay? So let's keep going. The patient's also experiencing. What comes after that are things that are wrong. Let's highlight, decrease urine output, history of weight gain. The vital signs are as follows. The blood pressure is 160 over 90. Is that normal? No. So we're going to highlight that. Heart rate 95. That's fine. Respiratory rate 20. That's fine. Temperature 98.6. That's fine. The lab results show elevated. Let me tell you something. When something's elevated, that means it's outside of the normal parameters, right? It's gone up. Elevated serum creatinine, BUN, and potassium. So we're going to go ahead and highlight that. And it says, along with decreased glomerular filtration rate. Decreased. Is that normal? No. 
So just like something's elevated, it's outside of the normal range because it's too high. If it's decreased, it's also outside of the normal range. It's too low. So we're going to go ahead and highlight the decreased GFR. Okay. Now that we've done that, let's take a look at our questions. The first one, it says, what is the client most, what is the most likely cause of the patient's symptoms and laboratory findings? Here are the options. Acute glomerulonephritis, acute kidney injury due to dehydration, chronic kidney disease progressing to end-stage renal failure, and then urinary tract infection, UTI. Those are the four options. So let's do process of elimination, right? Let's, let's go through these. The first one, acute glomerulonephritis. Well, here's the thing. With acute glomerulonephritis, I don't see anything in this question talking about, you know, that patient having protein in the urine or that patient having dark colored urine like cola colored urine or coffee colored urine or even pink urine or frothy urine and all those clinical manifestations that we would see in acute glomerulonephritis. We're not seeing that here. So I don't think that would be the answer. Next, acute kidney injury due to dehydration. Maybe, because definitely could be acute kidney injury. Look at what's going on. The patient is having swelling. They're holding on to fluids. Um, look at their medical history with hypertension, diabetes, chronic alcohol um, use. That absolutely will mess with your kidneys. That can cause you to go to kidney failure. Look how high the blood pressure is. They're holding on to all those fluids, right? That makes sense. Increase creatinine, BUN, all of this may decrease GFR. Absolutely. But guys, look at what it says. It says acute kidney injury due to dehydration. Remember what I taught you. If the whole thing is not correct, I'm talking about every single word in that answer choice. That whole thing is wrong and you better go with the next best answer. So even though AKI looks beautiful to us because everything I'm looking at here is telling me AKI is telling me that the kidneys are in trouble and that's why the patient's not urinating like they're supposed to. That's why they're holding on to all their fluids. That's why um, the blood pressure is so high. That's why they're gaining weight. That's why they have all that swelling and edema. Yes, but look at the other half of that answer. It says AKI due to what? Dehydration. What here tells us that the patient's dehydrated? Because I don't see anything about that patient having dry skin, dry mucous membranes, flat jugular veins, increased H and H. Nothing. I see nothing about um the your analysis showing that the patient's got um heavy uh, urine specific gravity, that urine being concentrated. Nothing, right? So yes, maybe they're an AKA, but due to dehydration, no. Next, chronic kidney disease progressing to end-stage renal failure. Absolutely. Because I'm seeing all those signs and symptoms now that this patient has um, kidney disease and absolutely could be chronic. Look at the patient's medical history. Hypertension, type 2 diabetes, chronic alcohol use. Absolutely. Right? Hypertension itself can cause, um, have it long enough or cause the kidneys to fail. Right? Having it long enough, chronic kidney disease. Diabetes. Diabetes promotes atherosclerosis, right? Causes those vessels to be weak. That could also cause that patient to ha have heart disease, hypertension, absolutely. And of course, um, alcohol use. Chronic. Cr so not, you know, acute, chronic for a long time. Alcohol use, right? So absolutely, that would be in our running. And last, UTI. Nothing here says UTI to me. I don't see a urinalysis showing WBCs, showing nitrates, showing protein, showing, you know, RBCs. I don't see any of that. I don't see increased temperature. I don't see patient having a change in cognition, especially when it's an older adult, they'll get confused when they have a UTI. I don't see anything about dysuria. I don't see anything about frequency. There's nothing here that says UTI to us. So the correct answer would be chronic kidney disease progressing to end-stage renal failure. Next question. Which laboratory finding is most 
concerning for acute injury in this patient. Here are the options. Elevated serum creatinine, decreased uh, white blood cell count, increased albumin levels, and normal sodium levels. I'll give you guys a second to think about that. Okay, so let's talk about it. Which one would be most concerning? It's going to be A, elevated serum creatinine levels. Um, guys, the creatinine, that is the most specific marker to kidney dysfunction. And I know in the nursing school, you always think creat BUN and creatinine, you kind of put them together, but there are so many other disorders that can cause the BUN to go up. But you see that creatinine go up, that is specific to kidneys, okay, kidney injury. Now, Let's look at the wrong answer choice. Decreased WBC count. Where would we see this? We would see this in like if a patient had bone marrow suppression, if they had some type of autoimmune disorder, or if the patient was on chemo, something that would cause their WBCs to go down. Increased albumin levels. Where would we see that? If the patient was severely dehydrated we could see increased albumin levels. Or if the patient had like an excessive intake of protein, because remember, albumin is a type of protein, we would see that, okay? Next, in last, sorry, normal sodium levels. Well, what's wrong with that? Why would we be concerned about normal sodium levels? Sodium is 135 to 145. If it's within that range, why would that be concerning? It would not. Question number three. Which electrolyte imbalance is most likely to occur in a patient with kidney failure? Hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, or hyponatremia? What do you guys think? Which electrolyte imbalance is most likely to occur in a patient with kidney failure? And guys, the correct answer is going to be hyperkalemia C. Why? Um, again, the kidneys are responsible for excretion, fluid and electrolyte excretion, right? So you have these toxins in your blood. It gets filtered through your kidneys. It produces urine and all those toxins come out through the urine. Guess what comes out through the urine? Potassium. So if you have kidney dysfunction, your kidneys aren't working the way they're supposed to. You're not going to be urinating the way you're supposed to. You should be urinating at least 30 mLs per hour, right? So if you're not urinating the way you're supposed to, you're not releasing potassium the way that you're supposed to. You're holding on to that potassium. That is a problem. And the reason it's a problem is because potassium has a very narrow therapeutic range, 3.5 to 5. That is it. Anything outside of that range, you're going to be at risk for cardiac dysrhythmias. Okay, that's going to be the, our biggest concern when it comes to electrolytes in a patient with kidney failure. We cannot um, afford to let that patient get out of that normal range for potassium, 3.5 to 5. Last question. Patient, a patient's blood pressure is 160 over 90. Which intervention is most appropriate to help manage his blood pressure and slow the progression of kidney disease? A, start a calcium channel blocker, B, administer a loop diuretic, C, start an ACE inhibitor or ARB, or D, increase the patient's sodium intake. You guys have an answer in mind? Okay. And guys, the correct answer is going to be C, start an um, ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Why? These two, these are the drug of choice for um, chronic kidney disease, especially if that patient's a diabetic. If they are diabetic and they have hypertension, that's going to be your drug of choice. It's going to be an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Here's the thing. Go back to the question. Which intervention is most appropriate to help manage the blood pressure? But there's another part help manage the blood pressure, and slow the progression of the d disease. These two have uh, been known to do that. Why? They, connect, they protect the kidney, okay? And they function by decreasing um, uh, the protein, okay? That makes a big difference. It decreases protein urine. Remember, guys, protein, those things are huge. Those are huge molecules. They should not be getting past the kidney to be found in the urine, right? They can be very harmful to the kidney. So that's how they protect the kidney. Okay. So we're going to give an ACE or a HARP is very protective of the kidney. So this would be great for someone with chronic kidney disease that also has hypertension and diabetes. 
starting a calcium channel blocker, that is great. Calcium channel blockers are great for the hypertension part, but what about the slowing the progression of the disease? No. Loop diuretic. A loop diuretic is great, again, for the hypertensive portion, but it doesn't have any protective measures for the kidneys. And last, increasing patient sodium intake. You crazy? Absolutely not. You increase that patient sodium intake, guess what? You're going to be making that patient hold on to even more fluids. Remember, kidneys not working. They're holding on to fluids. They're about to go into fluid overload. You're going to mess around and cause all that fluid to have to go somewhere and boom, fluids in the lungs, right? Now we're dealing with crackles and all types of other issues. So absolutely not. We are not increasing that patient's um, sodium intake. So for A and B, those are great. Um, for the hypertension, but it does nothing to protect the kidney. So that's why we did not choose it. But C does both. C, the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs, they both will help bring down the blood pressure and help slow down the progression of um, kidney disease. I have a bonus question for you. Actually, it's not on here. I'm going to have to. There we go. Okay. I'm going to read it to you guys. So it says the patient's blood pressure Oh, I lied. That was the question. I thought I had a bonus question, but I didn't. Just joking. That's it for the case study. Anyway, guys, um, I can actually do a whole... Listen, you guys better know. You better know your beta blockers. You better know your ACE inhibitors. You better know your calcium channel blockers. You better know um, your ARBs. I'm speaking to those students that are currently taking pharmacology or if you're in med surge right now, but you're in the cardiac portion and you're learning about hypertension, I'm telling you, you better know those drugs. You better know which drugs fall under which drug class. You better know those adverse effects of each, the, each drug that falls under the class. So here's the thing. You're not going to try to memorize each drug. It's too much, right? Most of these drugs, they're going to have the same ending, right? Your ACE inhibitors are going to end in pril, your beta blockers, LOL, you, your calcium channel blockers, PIN, EPIN, right? So that's how you figure out which class your drug falls under. Know your nursing interventions, your patient teachings, your adverse effects by drug class. Don't try to do it by drug. It's just too much to memorize and you're going to drive yourself crazy. Do it by class. But I promise you, if you're in a nursing program and you're taking one of those two courses that I mentioned, they're going to kill you with those type of questions. You have to know that stuff. So anyway, guys, let me know in the comment section what you thought about this case study. It was very short. Um, The next one I do, I'll make sure it's longer. I'll make sure there's more information for you to have to sift through just so you can kind of improve on your uh, critical thinking skills. But let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know what type of case studies you'd like to see me present on my next videos. Uh, don't forget, guys, check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. So many resources available there for you. Coming very soon is going to be my Nexus Nursing Test Bank for NCLEX, which just basically goes over the topic. If you don't know anything else, if you don't know anything else, you better know those topics that are in my uh, test bank to make sure you increase your chances of passing um, your board. So guys, be sure to check my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.